Welcome everyone to Calm Alert and Ready to Communicate, part two of two, sensory and communication strategies to fill your parent toolbox. My name is Loretta Tulipano and I'm a speech language pathologist with Children's Development Services at the Royal Victoria Regional Health Center and presenting with me um, again is... And I'm Shalyn Humanick occupational therapist with Children's Therapy Services out of Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital. On the slide, you can see our agenda for part two. So for part two's workshop, we're gonna be focusing on helping your child understand what you say. And the bulk of the, the workshop is going to revolve around putting everything together. So building your toolbox through daily routines and activities. We're gonna walk through a typical day and talk about some of the challenges that parents experience with their children. And we're going to highlight the strategies you can try. In part one, we introduced you to the concept of people games to engage your child. We hope it went well. If you did have some challenges, we're suggesting that you think about your child's sensory preference. For example, if your child likes rocking, a great people game to try might be row, row your boat. And if you do have questions uh, that you'd like to ask, we are suggesting that you reach out to your child's speech language pathologist or OT for some support. Again, we just want to reiterate that this information is about giving you the tools that you need to help your child. So we're really just trying to grow that toolbox of yours. We want to highlight that your child learns best in everyday routines and activities. You're the person your child wants to interact with the most. You have the most opportunities to interact with your child. So you're naturally the best person to help your child learn new skills. Your child's ability to understand words, sentences, directions, stories, and so on is referred to as receptive language. Typically, a child's receptive language is stronger than a child's expressive language. And we're, next, we're gonna introduce you to some strategies that will help you to build your child's receptive language bank. We have an analogy that we would like to present to you. And that is that we want you to think about the piggy bank or a bank account. Clearly, um, this is something that we all have a, you know, a fair amount of experience with. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the more deposits we have in our piggy bank or bank account, the better. And we really cannot make any withdrawals unless we've got some established deposits first. So the analogy that we want you to think about is think about questions as being withdrawals and think of deposits as being comments that you make. If children are going to be able to answer questions effectively, they need a strong receptive language bank first. The way to develop a strong receptive language bank is by commenting. Remember, the problem with asking a child who is nonverbal or one who has limited language a lot of questions is that they may not have the words to answer the questions. They may not understand the questions. Some children feel pressured when um, they're bombarded with a series of questions. And questions demand answers, whereas comments invite responses. And we certainly don't want to be putting nonverbal children under any increased pressure by bombarding them with questions. Let's imagine that I just blew some bubbles and the child that I'm with is either nonverbal or has limited language. My commenting might sound something like this. Bubbles. I blew bubbles. Falling. The bubbles are falling. Pop, pop, pop. All gone. The bubbles are all gone. 
And should my ch um, child in front of me have more language, then my sentences are gonna be a little bit longer and my vocabulary will be a little bit more sophisticated. We're suggesting that you take five. What exactly do we mean by that? Well, before engaging in any activity with your child, like doing a puzzle, having a bath, we're suggesting that you take five seconds and think about what comments you could be making. The less language a child has, the shorter your commenting should be. We've given you a series of, of comments that you can make if you're about to take a bath, but just do take a few seconds to think about what your comments might be. It's in order to help your child understand what you say, we're going to suggest that you really keep your language short and simple, stress the words that you want your child to understand. So if, when you were listening to me earlier talking about bubbles, hopefully you noticed that I really was stressing some of those words. Show your child what you're talking about. You're going to do that by having um, the actual object in front of the child. You're going to use lots of gestures, pictures, any of those things help a child build their understanding. And of course, be very repetitious. We know that children learn through repetition. And we just want to highlight that these strategies not only help build receptive language, but they're also very effective in helping your child to use language. Visual strategies are an important and efficient part of our everyday. Think about first thing in the morning how you might refer to your day timer to find out what's happening today or during the rest of the week. Think about hopping into the car. Think of the signs that you are using and seeing. Think about the menus in our fast food outlets. The reason that pictures are everywhere is that they're, they are a very efficient and quick way to provide information. We've included a short list of some of the visual strategies that we often use with preschoolers. And one of the things we wanted to just touch upon again is the benefits behind using visual strategies. We illustrated in the previous slide how they're an awesome way to build receptive language. The other reason for using them is they help children to predict what is going to be happening next. And children and adults alike, we all like to know what is happening now and what will happen next. And that's very regulating for all of us. The next slide will briefly illustrate a first then board for you. And the slide after that will briefly illustrate a visual schedule. I know you don't want to brush your teeth, but look, look here. First, you're going to brush your teeth, then we'll go outside, okay? Then what do I have to do for the fork? Look here. First, what are you going to do? Brush my teeth, go outside. Okay, so first we're going to brush your teeth. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get your toothbrush. Before we go outside, let's remember what we need to do, okay? We already did the sunscreen, but we didn't do the hat. Oh, okay, get your hat on. That's what we need to do next. Get your hat on. That's pretty good. Okay, what's next? So sunscreen, then your hat. Then shoes. Oh, get your shoes. Okay, and it might take you a while to get your shoes on. So what's going to happen after we put on your shoes? We go outside! Yay! So we've talked about, um, in the first night, sensory strategies, strategies to help build expressive language, and in this video we've talked about some strategies to help promote that understanding and receptive language piece. So now we're going to try to tie it all together. Um, and take all of these little tools that and strategies that we've talked about and put it together into your child's daily activities and routines. So just as a reminder, we are bringing back the pyramid. Um, and as we go through the your child's kind of everyday routine, think to yourself, um, if the routine itself is very challenging, 
and dysregulating for your child, then you're going to simply focus on the sensory processing and regulation strategies to help get them regulated to be able to participate in that routine. But if your child is regulated um, during that routine, then you would want to move up the pyramid and that's when you can focus on the communication strategies. So throughout the day, you kind of need to think to yourself, where is my child on the pyramid? If they're dysregulated, focus simply on regulation sensory strategies. If they're regulated, then you can kind of up the ante and start focusing on those communication strategies. Moving forward, you want to make sure that your expectations for your child are appropriate because if your expectations are too high, it can often become frustrating and dysregulating for both your child and yourself. So you want to make sure that there is an achievable expectation. So for example, if your child is say three years old, but maybe they don't have um, any language at this point, then your goal isn't for them to start saying sentences. You would want them to start using um, single words would be a good starting point, for example. So we'll tie it all together, all of the sensory stuff we've already learned about, as well as all the communication strategies we've learned about as we go through a typical day of what you and your child um, will do. So one of the first things that happens every day would be dressing. So what are some challenges that you might see with your child um, during this time? So if you put on your sensory, sensory hat and think about, are they really picky about what clothes they're wearing? So are they maybe having some tactile um, sensitivities like a rabbit? Maybe they're just really fussy during um, those clothing changes. So are they not understanding um, that it's time to get changed or they're not liking the feeling of the new clothing? Are they too busy to, to participate in that, um, that routine? Maybe they're more under responsive and don't realize that their clothes are really twisted on their bodies or on backwards. So we'll go through um, discussing um, how we can help make dressing a, a more positive experience by becoming a detective and looking at everything through a sensory lens and then also providing uh, strategies using the communication lens as well. So what can you do um, to help that routine be more manageable? So if your child is dysregulated during dressing, what can we um, do from a sensory perspective to help um, achieve that state of regulation? So maybe you want to have your child engage in some heavy work, organizing activities. So maybe they carry the laundry basket or they do some jumping jacks. Um, the other thing too to help them feel comfortable if they're a little bit like a rabbit, um, maybe they need to be sitting well supported with their feet on the ground to help them know where their body is in space. Thinking about touch, maybe your child is like a rabbit and doesn't like tags, so you need to be mindful of what type of material is the clothing. Are there tags in the material? Um, you know, maybe they don't like socks with a seam, so you have to find the right socks. Um, you know, make sure you're pre-washing clothing if they're really sensitive um, to the texture and feeling of some clothing. Um, and just respect what feels good for them. So if your child really only likes leggings, then that's okay. Maybe jeans isn't their thing and, and that's all right. So the other thing to think about with dressing is maybe the sight, sound, smell, and taste that's going on in the environment. Um, sometimes dressing in front of a mirror can really help with that visual feedback to um, for the child to see what they're doing and also to let the child see what you're doing to them. You know, use a song as a distraction. Maybe if your kid loves music, you sing, make up some sort of dressing song. So it's also giving them a clear start to the activity and a clear end point to that activity. Think also about, you know, if they're sensitive to smells, are you using fabric softener? What type of detergent are you using? So you just are trying to be a detective um, and trying to figure out if this is a challenging activity, why it might be from a sensory perspective. So Shallon was chatting earlier about thinking about your routine. So we're going to focus on communication if your child is regulated when you're dressing. So 
assuming that your child is regulated during dressing routines, let's talk about how we might build communication. So we're going to get face to face. You're going to think about what communication turn your little person might take. It might be that you're trying to increase that ch your child's receptive language. So you might want to give him instructions like put your pants on. And if that's the case, you're going to use short, simple language and you're going to want to really stress the important words. So for example, put your pants on. I'm really highlighting that word so that um, it's making it easier for the child to understand. And you'll see that we've included a picture of a visual, a visual schedule, because visual schedules make the routine much easier. And also, as you're going through the visual schedule, you can be pointing and once a visual schedule has been used multiple times, it's um, a really nice way to have your child tell you what's going to come next. And earlier we talked about how visual schedule really helps build your child's understanding of language because they see what uh, is represented by the word. So the next routine we're going to talk about is toileting. But before we get into talking about sensory and communicative strategies that can be used during this routine, is I just want to highlight signs that your child will be showing you to indicate that they're actually ready to be toilet trained. So toileting um, in independence, and it, there's such a range um, of success. So you can be two years of age, all the way up to school entry, and sometimes even later. As a parent, we really want our kids to be toilet trained. However, sometimes the more we strongly encourage them um, down this path, they become more upset and kind of dig their heels in a bit more and in turn becomes a very negative experience. Because um, again, kids can control only a few things in life, what goes in their mouth, when it comes out, and when they go to sleep. So um, kids will often try to control um, this toileting piece. So just for your own knowledge signs that would indicate that your child might be ready would be that they're indicating to you that their diaper is wet or dirty so they're pointing to it with gestures they're telling you they're coming with you with the diaper off um maybe they're telling you when they have to go um maybe they're waking up from naps um and or nighttime sleeping dry because they need to be able to kind of stay dry for a good chunk of time um, or maybe they want privacy, you know, when they are going. So lots of times kids will go kind of in a corner, or hide behind a couch when they uh, do need to void. Mm -hmm. So if your child's showing signs of readiness, they can still have challenges with toileting. Uh, and what could those be? So some challenges might be that they avoid sitting on the toilet, trying to get them on the toilet or in the potty is, does not go well. Um, they're not able to communicate their needs. Maybe they have difficulty managing their clothing so they can't take pull their pants down or pull their pants up. Maybe they really hate the sounds that goes on in a washroom so they just kind of avoid it completely. So sensory strategies um, using the movement and body awareness sense to help support successful toileting. Maybe we want to do some heavy work and movement activities first. So again, any of those push, pull, carry heavy things, jumping jacks, um, crawling, obstacle courses, any of that. Um, maybe too to help them feel more secure on the toilet. You want to use a reducer ring um, and have a step stool that their feet are resting on flat. So if you're able to have your fat feet flat on the ground, it gives you a better sense of where you are um, in space, hence feeling more comfortable on the toilet. Uh, for touch for toileting, sometimes think about it if your child is sensitive to touch, maybe they would benefit from using cloth diapers. Um, maybe sometimes they don't like the feeling of the toilet on their skin so maybe just having them sit on the toilet with their diaper on first is a great starting point again remembering your child's sensory profile and achievable expectations right so if your child tends to have more of a rabbit over responsive sensory profile you want to use that gradual exposure bit by bit strategy with them um, to, you know, give them some feelings of success and achievement. 
for toileting and the sensory systems of sight, sound, and smell. Again, remember your child's sensory preferences um, and maybe consider some of the following to help make that toileting um, routine a bit more of a positive experience. So maybe play music. Maybe if they're sensitive to sounds, you want to make sure that the, the lid is uh, closed before flushing. Maybe they don't like the bright lights, so you want to dim the lights, sing songs, read books, and also model toileting, so show them how to use the toilet. When thinking about which communication goal you're going to work on, you're either going to be thinking about building your child's understanding of directions or his use of language. Either way, it's very helpful to have a visual schedule. Again, as indicated earlier, when you're referring your child to a picture, that helps your child with the meaning of the words that you're using. And so if you're hoping to have your child follow directions like sit on the toilet or pull your pants down, you're going to want to use um, short and simple language, stressing the words you want your child to understand. And that would be really helpful. If your goal is to have your child using some language, again, the visual schedule is your friend. After frequent use of a visual schedule, the idea is that you would pause very expectantly looking at your child to have him fill in the blank or to say the next step on the visual schedule. So now we'll move on to mealtime. Um, so with mealtime, you always want to have a positive mealtime experience. And if you think about it, your child needs to be regulated in order to sit at the table and participate in that mealtime. And you want to keep those expectations for how long they need to stay at that table. Um, they need to be appropriate expectations. Um, so some challenges that are often parents often present um, with their children is that maybe they're picky eaters. So maybe they're only eating you know goldfish crackers and chicken nuggets and some milk and that's all they're eating um or maybe they're only eating carbs and not anything else from any of the other food groups um, maybe they're gagging when they're eating so maybe they're putting too much food in their mouth not realizing it's full and then their mouth becomes so full that they gag um, or maybe they're having some difficulty with different textures so perhaps the child only likes mushy pureed foods and has a hard time with crunchier foods or maybe vice versa. So again, thinking sensory, um, sensory wise, so what are your, what's your child's preferences um, and what kind of sensory strategies and communication strategies can we provide during this time to make it a more positive and successful experience. So what are some strategies that you can do to try to help promote a positive mealtime experience? or expand your child's uh, repertoire of foods. So maybe if they're having difficulty sitting and eating at mealtime, maybe do some heavy work um, organizing movement activities before coming to the table. Maybe um, providing some supportive seating, so maybe they would benefit from having their feet resting on a flat surface. Uh, maybe um, using what us as occupational therapists will sometimes recommend is like a move and sit cushion. So it's a little cushion on the chair that kids can kind of wiggle while they're sitting. So they're still able to move a little bit, but able to stay um, at the table or maybe using like a, a weighted lap animal or sock across their lap to give some more um, proprioceptive deep pressure input. Think about touch, smell, and taste of the food and what your child's typical sensory profile is and preferences with regards to these. So um, with mealtime and exploring new foods, you want the kids to be able to touch and play with it. Look at little Levi in this picture. He's being allowed to play with it, touch it, get all over his hands, all over his face. Um, you maybe want to use some dips for them to dip the food in. Even if they don't eat the food, they can at least lick the dip off of that item. Um, be really mindful of what your child's preference is for taste or texture. So if they're sensitive to certain foods, you don't want to um, do a big dramatic change, but you want to, again, use that gradual exposure. So maybe if they really like mashed potatoes, but they won't eat any other vegetables. Maybe you can finally uh, grind up uh, pieces of carrot or broccoli into that mashed potato um, 
for them to eat it that way. So they're just kind of gently nudging the, the boundaries. Think about um, if your child doesn't like food touching, using a divided plate, or maybe having two or more plates, or even having his food on one plate, and if your child doesn't like the look of something, that there's a bowl or a plate um, on his tray that he can take, touch the food and put it over to the spot that he doesn't like onto that other plate. Um, if your child is a really busy kiddo and has a hard time sitting still, you still wanna keep mealtime as a positive experience. So start with an achievable expectation, uh, say for one minute, and maybe pair that with a timer. So it has a clear end point for how long um, your child needs to stay sitting at the table. Maybe you could also position the child's um, so their back is facing the majority of the distractions to keep them focused on the meal in front of them. Communication is a lovely goal to strive for during snack or meal time. So getting face to face is actually also often much easier during a snack or a meal time, but we just want to reiterate that that's the ideal position. If we're going to work on increasing a child's use of gesture or words, we want you thinking about the bit by bit strategy. So you're going to give the child a little bit of something. So maybe they're having an apple. You're going to give them perhaps a couple of slices of an apple, and then you're going to use that wait strategy that we talked about. So again, remember, you're not just waiting, you're leaning forward, you're smiling, you have that expectant look, which is really um, everything about your body says, please um, take a turn and ask for more. And if they don't, that's okay. You're gonna model what they could say instead. Another great opportunity is for your child to make a choice. So offering choices happens really easily at mealtime or snack time. So offer your child a cracker or a banana. And the important point here to remember is that if your child loves bananas, then you're gonna to wanna to place the word banana last because it'll be much easier for your child to say the word banana if it's last as opposed to the first choice. As we indicated earlier, keep your language short and simple and stress the words that you want your child to understand. So if you're, um, so for example, more juice, you're gonna place extra emphasis on juice, drink the juice. So placing more emphasis on the words that you really want your child to understand. We'll move on to grooming and bathing um, as part of your child's everyday uh, routines. So lots of times parents will often talk about some challenges with these such as the child hates having their nails cut, doesn't like having their hair washed, really hard to get to brush their hair, um, don't like going in the bath, and this often cause a lot, can cause a lot of dysregulation during these activities. So to help promote regulation and keeping your child calm and alert during these activities, you can always engage your child in some heavy work, um, deep pressure organizing activities before, um, have them sit in a beanbag chair or on a uh, move and sit cushion while you brush their hair or cut their nails. Uh, maybe give some deep pressure massage to their head before any hair care. Um, if they don't like the bath, maybe trying a shower um, maybe they like that better. Maybe, um, a, you know, using a weighted lap animal or sock across their lap or even um, across their shoulders to help promote that regulation and calmness during these activities. In regards to touch, um, maybe try cutting their nails when they're sleeping. Uh, maybe try brushing their hair in front of a mirror so the child can see when the brush is coming. Uh, maybe have the child, you know, brush their hair once and then you do it another time. Um, think about the temperature of the water. Um, encourage water play activities outside of bath time so they get used to that playing in the water. Maybe only use a little tiny amount of water in the bathtub. Um, for brushing their teeth, maybe you, you know, you you use two toothbrushes, one for you and one for your child, and you do it together. 
Um, maybe for some of these, um, you want to do it in front of a mirror so the child can see what's going on. Um, for like brushing teeth, washing hands, um, maybe even for brushing hair, using a song um, can really help, you know, help them complete that activity because it also gives them a clear start and a clear end point to that activity. Um, think about the scent of the toothpaste or the taste of the toothpaste. Think about the scent of the soap and shampoo if they're sensitive um, to smells. Um, maybe even just kind of getting them to cover their eyes while you're washing their hair are all great starting points. Or a visual timer can also help for many of these things. So kids too can often love the bath and then have a hard time getting out of the bath. Um, so we often recommend using a timer to help define that end point to that activity. But that can also be used for tooth brushing, um, hand washing, any of those. In terms of facilitating communication during grooming, um, if possible, try and get face to face. So that will depend obviously on the uh, grooming activity. But um, as Shallon has said, using a song is often a strategy that families find helpful, especially with brushing teeth. Um, if you're starting a routine, We've indicated that the wait strategy is super helpful um, as you could say, get your toothbrush, put on your and uh, wait. And then the child could fill in the blank with toothpaste. You could point to the picture of toothpaste to help um, keep your language short and simple and stress the words that you're wanting your child to understand. So. If you're wanting um, to ask your child to get the toothpaste, you know, you're going to really want to highlight the word toothpaste. So what are some challenges that your child might be having with bedtime? So maybe they have difficulty falling asleep or maybe they have difficulty staying asleep. Um, Maybe it's really difficult to establish a consistent bedtime routine depending on, you know, what's going on in the day and parents' schedules. So what, we, what can we do to help support um, success with this routine? So we can make sure that we plan some heavy work organizing activities in the evening. Um, we want to make sure we provide lots of kind of calming activities leading up to the bedtime. So when we say calming, we want to think of, you know, rock, you know, maybe sitting in the rocking chair, reading a book, um, quiet, soft music playing in the background, big snuggles. These are the times um, with bedtime you don't really want to engage in chase games or big, fast body movements because you don't want to kind of rev them up. You want to kind of bring them down. Um, and have them start calming to help settle to sleep easier. So for those kiddos who really like proprioceptive deep pressure, maybe they would benefit from using a heavier blanket. Um, for example, one of your grandma's old quilts that are really heavy. Maybe they really like big, firm, deep touch squishes and big hugs before bed. And then there's also those kiddos who are maybe sensitive to some tactile input. So think about what type of material material their pajamas are. Um, are there tags in the pajamas? Um, think about to the bedding material. Is it, you know, flannel sheets or is there something in their bed that could be bothering them? So just things to think about to help keep them regulated as they get ready for bed. Mm -hmm. For sight, sound, and smell, think about maybe your child would benefit from a night light. Um, try to maybe use, keep the lights dim as you start going through that bedtime routine. Keep the voices quiet, soft music playing in the background. Think about the colors on the wall. Um, maybe try to keep a neutral color just so it's not overwhelming um, and dysregulating for them. Think also about, I would say, if there's any fabric softener or laundry detergent scent on the sheets, if they're sensitive to that smell piece. At bedtime, some of the most common communication goals revolve around the visual schedule and the bedtime routine um, with respect to book. So 
Use a visual schedule. That's often a really regulating and helpful thing to do from a communication point of view. If you're reviewing the visual schedule with your child, pause, use that wait strategy. So after you've had a bath and you're pointing to drying off, and before you get to brush teeth, you're just gonna pause, look at your child and have them fill in the blank with a word, or if they're nonverbal, you can use the gesture for brushing teeth to have them take a turn. Um, as Shallon said, reading books are a great way to help your child to get ready for bedtime. And it's really helpful if you have a repetitive book so that you can have the child fill in the blank, pause again before the last word, help them fill in the blank again. It could be a word, it can be a gesture. And if you've um, been trying first then boards, um, the board doesn't necessarily need to be in front of you as long as you're keeping your language nice, short and simple by using similar language. So first pajamas, then a book. And lastly, just stress the words that you're hoping uh, to help your child understand, like turn the page and so on. We've now reached the end of part two of our online version of Calm Alert and Ready to Communicate. We hope that you have learned a few strategies and that you, you will be successful in using them. Should you have any questions, we'd like to suggest that you reach out to your child's speech language pathologist or occupational therapist for some further support. And we want to thank you so much for tuning in and watching.